Booktube, and welcome back to the library tour of Doom. This is a library tour through all the books in my collection, and all the books that have ever been in my collection, and every ebook. Uh, so it's going to take a while. <laughs> We're doing one book a day, uh, and today I am breaking with the pattern of the week by not showing you a book that I don't own. I've been showing a bunch of books that I currently don't own. I've been using the Rad Pad to show you pictures of books and talk about them a bit. Uh, of items that have passed through my hands at one point or another. You book people will, you are, you're all book people, so you'll know what I mean. Uh, you get a book, you like it, you have no good reason to get rid of it, and yet it disappears. You do get rid of it somehow. Prior to this, I suspect most of it is my own fault. I am an inveterate giver of books. What's the matter? Everybody's a critic. <laughs> We're, I am an inveterate giver of books. I love to give books to people, even if they're only vaguely interested. Uh, and that results <clears throat> in things disappearing <laughs> when I want to lay my hands on them. Now, I've been trying to be better about that. Uh, I've been trying to fix the mechanism of that. The mechanism in my mind for that has always been give the book, put it immediately in an envelope, a padded envelope, and send it out, and then think the Brattle will provide. The Brattle is a used bookstore here in Boston. A number of you have mentioned to me that it's been a while since I went there. I might point out it's only been a few days since I went there, but apparently you'd like me to go to the Brattle every day. Uh, one way or another, they are a used bookstore here in, Battle, in Boston. They have a great turnover of books. So it has been my belief for going on 60 years now that if I need a book, if I want a book, if suddenly I realize I want that there's a hole in my collection, the Brattle will provide. Sooner or later, their turnover will turn up that book. And what I need to do is fix that mechanism so that when I realize that I want to give somebody a book, I should first think the Brattle will provide and then wait. And when the Brattle does provide, then put that book in an envelope and mail it out instead of mailing out my copy. I would like to do that. That is, as, as an old friend of mine pointed out to me years ago when I pointed this problem out to him, he said, you know, that second approach isn't any less generous than the first approach. <laughs> Just a light went off in my head. I agree with that. That is true. That is true. That the second approach is not me being niggardly in some way, me being stubborn or wanting to hold on to my stuff. It's every bit as generous. It's just more realistic. It means I'm not giving away books that I love. <laughs> and just hoping that I get them back again. Uh, most of the examples that we've seen on the Rad Pad of books that I no longer own have been like that. Books that I wish I did still own. Uh, but today's uh, today I have a book in hand. Uh, a book that uh, I've had many copies of this. The, the mass market paperback of it, for instance, had a really interesting design. One that mass market paperbacks don't tend to have. When you it had uh, two covers, you know. So you have the the step back. You have a piece of artwork on the inside of the paperback's front cover. In this case, it wasn't unobscured artwork. There were a whole bunch of blurbs on that inside cover. But in addition to that, when you opened up that outer cover, it had a flap, a, like a French flap, only it wasn't a French flap. Instead, there was a perforation along the outer edge. It was a bookmark that you could pull off that was made for the book, and you, you could use that in the mass market. I would love it if every mass market were made that way. Instead, that mass market paperback of this book was the only one I ever saw that had that that had that arrangement. Uh, I've also had the ugly, the requisite American, hideous American cover, ugly version, and a bunch of others. Uh, and I have given away this book many, many times, many times. I have a copy now, a uh, hardcover from the UK, and it's the one I'm keeping. <laughs> so if I find another one, I will. I, I always grab extras when I see them, just to, to give them away. I know I'm going to want to. And it's this, from the early 1990s. It's Body and Soul by Frank Conroy. Uh, a sweet and devil-haunted man uh, who... Actually, devil-haunted man is wrong. Devil-haunted man is the comfortable euphemism we use for alcoholic. And we shouldn't use it euphemisms for that because it's really serious one way or another i think he was haunted in a few other ways too he was the presiding genius at the iowa writers workshop uh for a while in a very idiosyncratic way and before that and largely contributing to that he wrote uh, a book a non-fiction work a memoir called stop time that is astonishing uh in a lot of ways it was an unbelievable virtue virtuoso debut 
of a type that most authors, as he used to quip, don't recover from. <laughs> uh, and it's also has one of the funniest set pieces that I've read in any literature about a food fight, of all things. Uh, and that memoir was very, very autobiographical, but also very fictional. You could tell that there, there was a generous amount of fictional sensibility woven in. It's just the way a memoir should be done. Just the way. When I read, uh, when I read a memoir and I am 200 pages in and I don't think I've been lied to even once, I'm disappointed. <laughs> I want there to be, I want a memoir to be a meditation on someone's life all across the whole spectrum of writing rather than one of the, you know, you're just sitting on somebody's couch in, in Kew Gardens and they're walking you through every picture in a photo album, very scrupulously reading out the dates and times and making sure that everything's right with receipts. I always think that a memoir that does only that is, is failing. It has failed in its in its message. Uh, and Stop Time doesn't do that. Very much doesn't do that. What a book. No idea if Stop Time is in print. That'd be a terrible shame if that were out of print. Uh, and then a while later, another book came out along the same lines called Midair that was a pretty sophomoric uh, in the sense of a sophomore slump type of thing. It was still very good on proficiency level, but uh, it wasn't a great book. Stop Time is a great book, in a minor key. And I wasn't the only one who was hoping that sooner or later Frank Conroy would mu would muster the discipline uh, or the detox to write a great book. Uh, and he did. That's what this is. Body and Soul is a novel. came out long after the last long concerted thing that he had written. It's a novel about a young piano prodigy named Claude who lives in New York with his mother. His mother is mentally troubled. They aren't wealthy. This book could not take place now, where ordinary people can't live in New York now. So, uh, but at the time they could, and, and Claude has a little toy piano in his basement room, and he has a large amount of inborn talent. He has a large amount of genius, what we call genius and aptitude. It needs training. And eventually, through a, a succession of, of halfway accidents and a little bit of nervy persistence on his part, he gets training from a number of different people, including most especially a man named Weisfeld, who is not only his teacher, but his friend, his employer, his, his mentor. Uh, and uh, unlike some of his other more restrictive teachers, Weisfeld gives Claude not only great musical instruction that frees his talent instead of <clears throat> constraining it, but also a great understanding of music. It teaches him music and a lot about life as well. Uh, it, it, Claude's visits to Weisfeld's brownstone become the linchpin of his whole life. They take over from everything else in a good way. Uh, and we, we follow Claude as he grows up. We see him go from uh, 13 year old to a teenager he falls in love with the daughter of a very powerful man uh in a much higher strata of society than he did you might some people might be seeing echoes of that in frank conroy himself uh only in this case the the powerful man is a politician not a judge <laughs> uh, but uh we follow claude as he he's, as he grows uh mr weisfeld gets older they they remain in dis, just inseparable friends, but Claude also experiments not only with playing and with with uh, different types of classical music, uh, including atonal and that sort of thing. He also starts composing and starts to get to know the rest of the musical world, and falls in love and falls out of love and has it's 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 a, a biographical novel in the sense of, for instance, Thomas Mann's Doctor Faustus. Uh, and it's wonderful. It's fantastic. It is one of the best evocations of music in fiction that I've ever read, especially classical music. And also one of the best evocations of the artistic experience. I know I shouldn't do this because that's what you want to see, right? They want to see you, baby. They don't care about books. They want to see you. They do. They want to see my little bee. Oh, they do. They want to see you. Can you blame me? You're so pretty. You are. As you can see, maybe you can tell over my shoulder that it is a beautiful day. 
the greens of the trees are even brighter. They've drunk deep in the last 20 hours of rain. <laughs> and, and the skies are blue with not a cloud anywhere. Uh, so I have a feeling that after this video is done, we're going to go on a WALK of epic proportions. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is one of you called this Frida's Pilates. <laughs> she stretches. Are you going to come down here? Oof. Oh. <laughs> But she's gone wandering. She will do a little circuit of the kitchen. She forlornly does little circuits of the kitchen now and then, hoping to find a mouse. But she has killed all the mice here. <laughs> there, there, if there are any left, they are sticking to the cupboards until two or three in the morning. When what I can only assume they consider to be the Great Destroyer, all in capital letters, is asleep. Because <laughs> she's, she's accounted for quite a few generations of them, I would think. But, but she does forlornly anyway, she looks. But anyway... Uh, this is thrilling. This book is thrilling. It is a great novel. It is just the sort of thing that Frank Conroy's friends and fans were hoping he would write before he died, before he effectively killed himself. And it happened. I don't know if Body and Soul is still in print. I cannot recommend it strongly enough to you. Uh, are you going to come up here? Yeah! Oh, no, no. I think she might be going to... She came up, but not up to her perch, so she might be going to make her bed. Which does oh she didn't she just laid down next to me good see she just laid down next to me she didn't, she didn't bother to fuss with the pillows and uh, quite a few of you emailed and said that was the highlight of your week to watch her do that in an earlier video when the highlight of your week should be me okay eyes on the prize I'm the cute one anyway if I could get back to the book <laughs> uh, I want to read you a couple of parts from this. It's beautifully done. Just beautifully done. This is the um, H and H Hamish, Hamil Hamish Hamil Hamilton in London. This is the Hamish Hamilton uh, edition that has the slightly blurry, blurry fingers on the piano keyboard and just one quote on the back from Vanity Fair. Uh, the blurb from Vanity Fair. I don't remember who wrote this, but it's uh, it is an old-fashioned, beautifully written, and hypnotically readable story about a gifted young pianist. In it, Conroy pulls off one of the most difficult achievements imaginable in fiction, writing about an artist and making it seem authentic. The novel is the best novel I have read this year, and more, his best, his is the best story I know of in a long, long time. Oh, God. No, don't start, baby. <laughs> don't start. Uh, and I, I, I think that is correct. Uh, I want to read you just a couple of bits here. That are, I could read the whole of this thing. Uh, if, if, all of it is so good. Uh, but uh, these aren't going to be spoilers. Believe you me, you are not going to see the end of this book coming. <laughs> Believe you me, you won't. I couldn't spoil it if I wanted to. But I want to do, uh, we'll do the first scene here just to give you an idea of all the stuff that, that Conroy is doing here and also all the stuff he isn't doing. All the stuff that he respects your intelligence enough not to do, not to lay out for you. Uh, so there's one point in the novel where young Claude, I think 13 or 14 years old, uh, finds a notebook uh, that had been left behind by a student at the Bentley School, a very prestigious private school in New York. Uh, Claude doesn't have anywhere near the money to go there, of course, he knows that. But he is starting to become aware enough and old enough to know that he might like the advantages of such a place. He still has a chip on his shoulder about it. He, he, he still wears the Eisenhower jacket. He still uh, is trying to be a little bit cool among his peers. But he's starting to dream about more than that. And he's starting to realize that, you know, his makeshift jobs and his basement apartment are not going to get him there. And he's right about that. And he would be just as right about that in 2021. Uh, but he, he, just, he isn't really thinking of anything when he goes to the Bentley School to return the notebook to the student who, who has his name in the book. Uh, a surly receptionist says, well, you can just leave it with me. And Claude says, I'd rather hand it directly to him if you don't mind. And the receptionist says, ah, probably looking for a tip, aren't you? And that incenses Claude. Uh, it, it just infuriates him to be, to be thought of that way. It, he instructs the man to go and get the student. And uh, the man does. But Claude is already starting to think, well, what about this place? He asks the student, uh, uh, Ivan Andrews, when he, comes to, when he comes to collect his notebook, says, what is this place? And Andrews is a little bit amazed that he hasn't heard of it. This is probably really expensive to go here. Huh? Do they have scholarships? And Andrews says, well, yeah, they do have scholarships for math prodigies or the children of slain World War II heroes. In other words, you have to be exceptional. 
you have to have some sort of exceptional gift to get a scholarship here. And this is sort of idly asked, Claude, do you have an exceptional gift? And Claude says, yes, the piano. Uh, and Andrews doesn't dismiss the idea. Instead, he brings Claude to the faculty lounge and a, a teacher at the school happens to be in there and Claude mentions, I'm, I heard about scholarships and I have a skill at the piano. And the teacher decides on a whim, just because he has nothing better to do at that moment, he decides at a whim to test it, to bring Claude to, to an auditorium and put him in front of a piano. And that's the scene that I want to show you. Uh, well, you'd think that Claude is really nervous, but he's not. He's actually not. Before they go down there, Andrews is nervous. And Claude says, don't worry, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and then we get the moment. Uh, uh, Claude sat down at a bench and regarded the keyboard. So familiar, that black and white pattern. He felt a mild, comfortable thrill. No matter how weird or mysterious the surroundings, whether the comfortable basement of Weisfeld's music store, the spooky living room of Maestro Kimmel, the dim chaos of his own room, the brittle splendor of the Fisk's house. No matter where he was, where he sat down, when he sat down at the piano, the world around him simply didn't matter. His physical relationship was fixed. All else was transitory. He was located. It flitted through his mind to play something flashy. The last movement of the Chopin B-flat minor sonata, for instance, about as fast as anything he'd come across. But it seemed like giving too much away. And he would need the music. Instead, he found himself playing Bach's Little Fugue in G minor, not technically difficult, but a strong and solid piece. At the third entrance of the three-note motif, back in the tonic, he let himself add some fire, and, every, and even a very slight, very smooth accelerando. He built to the finish and lifted his arms. Ivan, who had been looking at the floor, raised his head and smiled. The tall man, that's the, the teacher that they meet in the lounge, uh, said, who are you? Then he wheeled on Ivan. Andrews, is this a prank? Where did you get this boy? I've never seen him before today, sir. I lost a notebook and he came here to return it not more than half an hour ago. What? <laughs> the man seemed almost angry. You mean he just walked in? <laughs> yes, sir. Claude said, I wanted to find out about scholarships. The tall man was momentarily speechless. Ivan stood waiting, and no one seemed to know what to do. So Claude played Chopin's Etude Number no. 5, Opus 10, easily, as Mr. Fredericks had taught him. The tall man turned out to be Dr. Morris, who taught history, and who made Andrews responsible for walking Claude through two days of tests. First, a repeat performance of the Bach and the Chopin for Dr. Satterwig, head of the music department, a grim, chunky man in his 40s, whose square face remained entirely expressionless during the playing. It was a different piano this time, a Steinway upright in Satterwaite's classroom. At the end, Satterwaite turned to Dr. Morris. What do you want to know? Your opinion, obviously. <laughs> About what? Oh, come on, George, Morris said, pursing his lips impatiently. His playing! His playing! How good is he? We've never had anyone near his level, Satterwaite said, turning to the door. He plays quite a lot better than I do, better than I could ever hope to. He opened the door and left. Well, good heavens, Ivan burst out. You'd think he'd want to shake hands or something, ask a few questions. <laughs> Andrews, said Morris. Sorry, sir, Ivan said. <laughs> that, is, that is the scene, where, of course, the Bentley School takes, Claude. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted to bring it up for two reasons. One, Conroy doesn't describe the music. He describes the technicality of Claude's choices, but he doesn't describe what it sounds like, and he doesn't try to. He does elsewhere in the book sometimes, but not here. Not here. He wants you to do that. He wants you to put yourself in that classroom. And the second thing that's done beautifully here is that he doesn't need to psychoanalyze. He doesn't need to lay out on a table the insecurity of the mediocre teacher. A universal thing. Right, those who can do, those who can't teach. I've never agreed with that with that motto, and I still don't. But nevertheless, the faculties of prestigious schools like this, especially prestigious prep schools, are where mediocrities go in order to lord it over their inferiors, and they don't like being challenged on their home turf. And that is perfectly captured here without beating you over the head about it. It's it's done mainly through dialogue. I think that's fantastic. Uh, the story goes on, and one of the things that happens. Well, it, there, of course, uh, Mr. Weisfeld eventually dies, and it's heartbreaking. 
just heartbreaking. Uh, but he leaves Claude the brownstone. Uh, and Claude is perfectly happy with it. And except that there is a, a real estate developer who wants that whole row. And sooner or later, the building starts disappearing, all except Claude's. And he starts getting little notices, little slips, sometimes anonymous threats tacked to the door uh, of people wanting him to move, take an offer and leave. Of course, the building is, means everything to him. It's been his haven and his schoolroom forever. And it's a bequest of his best friend. So the, he's not intending to leave. And one night, a couple of men accost him and injure one of his hands. It's not permanent. There, it, there's nothing damaged beyond repair, but he has his hand in a cast with, with his fingers sticking out like that. So he can still play just a little. Uh, it could have been much, much worse. It was meant to be just a light but physical threat. And Claude doesn't know what to do. And in the course of his life, he, as I mentioned, he has he has fallen in love with the daughter of a very powerful man. And that gives him an avenue of something to do that a lot of people wouldn't have. Uh, though, as one character puts it in the book, I wonder how many people were faced with the same kind of coercion that you had and didn't know anybody to call. Uh, uh, but Claude does. And there is a scene, the comeuppance scene, that is so good. It's, it's a senator. It's Senator Barnes that I wanted to read it to you. And this will be, I won't, I won't read any more of the book. There's so many other scenes I could read, but I'll read this one to you. Uh, they rode in silence. Claude is with the senator. They are headed to the guy who is running the company that is doing all of this repossessing, all of this building repossessing, and who is obviously the person who caused all this to happen to Claude. You know, nothing was signed, of course, but it's, it's obvious that he is the one to blame. Uh, they rode on in silence. When they pulled up in front of the office building, the senator glanced at his watch. Henry, the driver, got out, walked around the front of the car, and opened Claude's door. This won't take long, Henry, the senator said, emerging. Yes, sir. Upstairs, in the waiting room of the Lurus Corporation, Tom Thorpe lunged up from his chair as Senator Barnes got out of the elevator. Good afternoon, Senator. Mr. Folsom is... His smile collapsed as Claude stepped forward. He looked from one face to the other, stunned into silence. Take us in the senator said. Thorpe moved down the hall, opened a door to a small office, ignored the secretary, tapped lightly on another door, opened it, and stepped aside. The senator entered, followed by Claude. Thorpe closed the door behind them without coming in. Folsom sat behind a large desk, a skyline of the east side revealed through the windows behind him. If he was surprised, he did not show it, his dark, wet eyes slow and steady. He got up and extended his hand. Senator, he said, this is an honor. The senator did not take his hand. Sit down, he said, and he did so himself. Claude took a chair. Folsom, his face still wooden, obeyed. I, uh, I'm wondering what, Folsom began. Conversation is not necessary, the old man said. He glanced again at his watch, then removed two slips of paper from his breast pocket. He slipped the first one across the desk. Call this number and tell them who you are. They're expecting you. Folsom took the paper and held it with both hands, studying the single phone number as if it were a code to be deciphered. Whose number is this? The police commissioner, the senator said, without expression. Mr. Witt. Folsom paused a minute, reached for the phone, and dialed. As he, wa as he waited, his eyes went to Claude, flicked down at the cast, and then away. This is Ed Folsom calling, he said. Yes, I'll hold. He leaned back in his chair, looked at the ceiling, and gave a barely audible sigh. Then his head came forward. Yes, this is Folsom. As he listened, there was a slight compression of his lips. After perhaps 30 seconds, he said, Yes, I understand, and hung up. Senator, he said, there must be some kind of mix-up here. I can assure you I know nothing about... Save it. Save it. The old man slid the second piece of paper across the, like a playing card. The mayor is expecting your call. Folsom lipped his licks nervously and bent over the paper. Claude could see what would soon be a bald spot on the crown of his head. Folsom said, I assure you this isn't... Make the call. Folsom did so. It took the mayor somewhat longer to say what he had to say than it had taken the police commissioner. Folsom replaced the receiver with care. His face was pale. Okay, the senator stood up and put both hands on Folsom's desk. One broken window on that building. One chipped brick. One hot rivet on the roof and you're out of business. One broken fingernail on this young man, and you're in jail. 
You'd better pray for his health. He pushed himself up and turned away. Claude followed him out. Halfway down the elevator, the old man said, I wonder where he got the name Luris. He owns the company, 60% of the stock in any case. Big contributor to the Democratic Party. He gave a, a sudden hearty belly laugh. A lot of good it did him. <laughs> and that is, uh, that's another scene from this book. I could read you many others. There is, there is particularly one virtuoso music scene uh, where, where for the very first time, Claude's music takes him over. Uh, and there's also a wonderful scene with Claude's mother and Al, a kind of uh, handyman figure that, that really helps to fix her. He's not a psychiatrist. He's not a doctor in any way, but he helps to fix her. He helps to, she's growing more and more manic and unhinged as the novel goes on, just for biochemical reasons, we assume. And he helps to ground her. And it's, there's a scene in which that really comes out and it's marvelously done. And there are a million other marvelous scenes. But I wanted to pick that one because again, of how much Conroy is letting you do. You are a partner in what he's doing, an equal partner. He trusts you enough to let you do a lot there. Imagine how that scene would have gone in the hands of a less accomplished writer. There wouldn't have been anything that would have been left to chance. You would have gotten everything, and it would have had a lot less power. It's up to you to wonder what that guy heard at the other end of those calls. And I think that makes it so much more effective. <laughs> so your, uh, your book for today is a longer one than usual. If I'm quoting from these things, then they are going to be long, and I don't want to do that. But your, the, the Library Tour of Doom today is a wholehearted recommendation, especially if you love classical music. If you love classical music and you know it, maybe you've played it a little, you have to read this book. You just have to. You're going to love it. Absolutely love it. But also, 12-tone, uh, atonal, jazz. If you love music, you're going to love this book. Conroy did. Uh, music was his heart and soul. A lot more so than writing prose. Odd thing to say about a director of the Writer's Workshop, but nevertheless, I don't think anyone who knew him would deny it. Uh, and one of my favorite novels of the 20th century of the latter half of the 20th century certainly so there you go that is your library tour of doom for the day i promise tomorrow's will be shorter uh but i'm going to wrap this up for now because uh, for the best possible reason a beautiful day beckons when we get back and we're all pooped and i shower and the bean eats a little the day will still be beautiful these are we are in the days here now where the sunset is always a long way off until it suddenly happens so there'll be time to make more videos and if, if I can think of something to say, <laughs> if I'm, I'm so shy and introverted, well, I might not be able to. But if I can think of something else to say, then I'll make more videos. But in the meantime, I'm going out a walking. So I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.